This is the Humans of Gaming Podcast, an open and honest conversation about games, life, and belief. Welcome to Humans of Gaming, I'm Drew Dixon, I am one of your hosts, I am the chief content nerd at Love Thy Nerd, and I'm joined by Chris Gwaltney. Hey Chris. Yo, I'm Chris, I'm the chief executive nerd with Love Thy Nerd, and I'm um, happy to be here on our podcast, Humans of Gaming, where we get to have people on that work in the industry or influence, influential in the industry, and get to just hear their story and dig a little deeper and find out who they are as people and what makes them tick and stuff. Yeah, we're excited about this one. But before we jump in, I have a question, Uh-oh. kind of like business question about our podcast uh, or logistics. <laughs> I don't know time what the right, what the right word is. Oh, okay. no, I, I think so. All right. I always wonder like what the best preposition is when I say I'm joined by or joined with. Joined well, as. No, that would. How work. would you? What's your what preposition? Would joined you use? to. <laughs> that definitely doesn't work. Uh, I don't know. Change it every week and see if we get okay. any. You know. Well, you I'd should recently, know. You're that. You're you're the well, editor. Well, it was funny. The like editor, I bro. was doing. Yeah, I know. I was doing these a bunch of these little interviews at Gen Con, and somebody like kind of got upset. They're like, "That was a weird preposition you chose." And so now <laughs> I'm upset? like, not upset, but like. It was like what, what, just sort of like thrown. Yeah, triggered. Like, him. why did you choose? I can't even remember which preposition it was, but it's kind of like, "Hey, that was odd. Why did you do that?" Um, oh, I think he said it in love. But well, it was hey, still- you know, you guys uh, listen to this can email us all your thoughts and opinions <laughs> yeah. about the preposition right. that we should, right. that Drew should use. Yeah, uh, yep. Drew at lovethynerd dot com. He'd love to hear from you. I uh, would do. Um, and you can tell me your thoughts about other gra- grammatical things like Oxford commas or um, mm-hmm. M dashes. So uh, our special guest is Richard Rouse. Hey, Richard, how are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm I'm loving b- being here. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to think how to work the preposition into this. I think it's joined by. I'm joined sure. by. That is That's the, N- that is the NPR like. standard. Oh, yeah. well, then that, oh, that's the case. Let's, yeah. yeah, done deal. They, we know the answer. They, yeah, they've been doing this for a while. I almost said Richard Rouse the third, but then I remembered when we had you on the first time, you were like, oh, I don't know. I don't like it. necessarily people to refer to me that way, so I didn't this time. But now I've acknowledged that you are the third in the line of Richard Rouse's. <laughs> wow. Which is fun. It's true. I mean, yeah, I feel like... I just a- think it. I think it looks great on paper. I just think it sounds weird out loud. Right, so, yeah. Hence... hence my personal preference, but I never correct anyone who does it. I only correct. Do you them have? Ask. Do you have children? By the way, I do. Yeah, and not, uh, is they are not. None of them are named Richard. Oh, so I you are like the one that well. you're the end of the line. A, <laughs> you are the one that put a stop to that nonsense. Well, see, it's funny. Uh, the the technically, I believe with with the suffixes, you're not supposed to name another one the same name with the suffix like the fourth if the first one is no longer alive so i oh. think technically oh. that's the rule and that was the case like my grandfather on the rouse side was no longer well neither grandfather mm. was alive when my kids were born um and so there's that but i think we would have gotten past that and just rolled with the fourth but i had told my wife that growing up i hated the third because it seemed ridiculous and it would always be on the class roll and people oh, would totally. call it out and say like Richard Rouse the third and then it would be ha 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 you know the whole class <laughs> would laugh and I did not like this and then sort of using it as an adult professionally was sort of you know reclaiming it or something as as you mm-hmm. do uh, and she was like right well then we, we're not going to use that because I don't want to put my kid through you know torture growing up <laughs> yeah. I was like no kids, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have said anything uh so yeah i don't i don't know how i i don't you get crap, I, I don't think like, about it much yeah did you get crap going growing up for your name because i know like you know there's the you mean other than the part the third part <laughs> yeah no like i was just thinking about people you know kids growing up richard for whatever reason dick is a short name for sure. richard yeah and uh you can also make whoever, it, uh, whoever you can came make up with Ricky. that was a dick <laughs> yeah. I think at the time it became prominent 
you know, a hundred years ago or whenever it was not slang for genitalia as well. Mm -hmm. So like that came later and then, you know, and my dad actually went by Dick for years before he couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or thought it was silly or something. I, and I yeah. never got a good story why he stopped. But it was before I was born, he'd stopped using dick. And I think it may have been Richard Nixon Association because he was tricky dick, if you may recall. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to be associated with that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's other bad things with my name because the last name Rouse rhymes with a lot of things. And if you were to change right. Ricky into Mickey, you could then yeah. change the there last you. name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, you were you. not you were not set up for success. No, no, but it's all good now. Yeah. Now I have one You've of the few, it. I have one of the few good boy names I found. I found it very difficult to find boy names that I liked when. What we are your kids names? My son. So one's a girl, and that's uh, uh, not Richard. And the, <laughs> the boy is named Malcolm. Oh, I like that. A solid, yeah. Uh, and then there is a fa- there's a relative on the on the. Um, my wife's side that's called Malcolm too. So that's nice. Strong. Cool. Well, uh, we had you on this podcast because you've made, you've made, you've worked on lots of games in the past. Uh, and you just not too long ago released a new game, the church in the darkness. And we had you on this show. Oh, kind of in the, er- kind of in the early days of humans. Games, that was a while back. Like. Yeah. That was a while back. Yeah. And, uh, we talked about church in the darkness then. And, um, now we can actually talk about it now that I've played it and other people have played it and it's out there in the world. So, um, yeah, but before we jump into that, I guess like, I mean, you've worked on I'm trying to remember sunset overdrive and you worked on, um, state of decay, right? What, how, how would you frame your work in the games industry for our listeners? Yeah, so the last, the last place I worked before endeavoring onto this project was at Microsoft. So there I worked on a bunch of things in different sort of non, you know, directorial capacity, shall we say. So like Sunset Overdrive was obviously being made by Insomniac and I like helped out sort of consulting on the multiplayer they were doing. And then I worked on Quantum Break and I worked on this one specific feature on that sort of prototyping things for it and stuff. Um, And like integrating it with Connect, which was ultimately cut. But uh, uh, then I spent the most time on State of Decay while I was there, and that was, you know, p- playing those, and and I came onto it right as the first game shipped, and yeah, worked on that was DLC. a cool game. I'm a big fan still. It's probably the game yeah. I've worked on that I like the most hmm. because I didn't make it myself. You know, it's like whatever you make the game <laughs> yourself, if you're me, you're not gonna like it anymore at the end. Uh, you know, because you, you see its flaws, or because you play it too much. Yeah, obsess over both, it. both of those things. You see the things you wish you had fixed that you didn't, that no one else can even perceive usually. Like they want other things fixed <laughs> that you like, right? But but yeah. there are things you wish you you had done that you didn't. And then, yeah, you've just played it so much. That it's the curse of the creative. It's, it's no longer fun. And you can't judge it from a distance of any kind because it's just all, you know all the reasons you got to these decisions instead of just, right. you know, when you play a game for the first time, you're seeing the final result and that's it, you know? Um, yeah. Whereas if you know, oh, we did this because of this and this was a concession for that. And so you've like forgiven yourself for it, maybe not being great or something. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. you lose that perspective or something that people genuinely like. You're like, oh, that's that thing we did in, a, in an afternoon. That was super easy, you know, but you, yeah, because it doesn't bear the scars of game development. It seems less. And I guess like you. the bigger the team too, the more you can be like, well, that was that person's fault. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, uh, no, I but... tend to not. I, I mean, every so often there's a, oh, there's that thing that person did and seeing it again. But mostly I don't because, well, I, you know, on something like Church in the Darkness, if I didn't like it and didn't get them to change it, it's my fault ultimately. Yeah. Uh, so right. I tend to not blame anyone but myself for the shortcomings I do. still. Sure. Um, yeah. And I suppose like game develop, especially now that you've kind of gone indie and everything, um, it's just really hard, you know, and so I, I, I would I would guess that having now gone through the experience of slaving, I shouldn't use that word, not slaving, um, <laughs> just like like working really freaking hard um, over a game like you have uh, probably puts it into perspective to give some grace to like, you know, anyone else who makes games, I would right. think. To give a little, a little, I'm sure they did the best they could, you know, sort of thought <laughs> yeah. to everything, assuming best intentions, despite yeah. the end product, product not necessarily working out. 
to, yeah. to your liking. You know, you're like, well, they probably had reasons for doing this, you know, instead <laughs> of like, what idiot did this thing? Well, <laughs> now we just we know... need to teach that kind of grace to the consumers and the gamers. <laughs> well, and, and often there's the, well, they did want to do that, but that didn't fit in memory or that, you know, mm. that, that had yeah. a problem with this other thing, couldn't get it done in time or, um, you know, just all the reasons that things don't go as perfectly as you'd like allows you yes allows you to forgive other folks that's the thing that's always i don't know astounding to me or something is like because i i have no clue about all of the intricacies of making games and this like i look at a screen and there's like pictures but it all boils down to like numbers i can't even begin to wrap my brain around any of that stuff so like the idea of me complaining or like pissing and moaning about things that didn't happen, like I can't possibly know <laughs> all of the the things that could have gone wrong or, you know, memory limitations or hardware limitations. Like I don't get any of that stuff. So it's always like, I don't know, it, it helps it helps me uh, temper my complaining. Well, not that I don't complain, but, you, but, know. you know, it's it's still OK to be critical of things to some extent right because you have you're allowed yeah. to have taste and like things and not like things and mm -hmm. um you know but certainly there's lots of games like state of decay is actually an interesting example of of that the first game in particular um just shipping in a pretty rough state uh and mm -hmm. then having some yeah. like depending on that was a very divisive game where people who liked it a lot liked it a lot and then people who just casually came in we're like, well, this is feels bad or like these animations mm. don't look good or why is mm -hmm. this thing clipping through this doorway? You know, things like that, that they prioritized making a big, expansive, simulated world sort of thing over the fact that the doors aren't actually solid. <laughs> you know, right, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're only, sure. the doors are there's a secret in the first game is the doors are only solid when they're closed. And then as soon as they're open, you can walk right through them and, and zombies can walk right through them and everything. So they're not like a fully simulated physics object like they would be in a thief game or something yeah, like that. I definitely um, remember the zombies walking through them. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if, if the door is like not all the way shut, it looks like they're walking through. But if you get used to how the game works, you know that and you forgive it and you move on because the rest of it makes right. up for it. Um, yeah. And they, you know, they were working on not a huge budget and... Mm -hmm. um, prioritized making a very big game that you could play for a long time over making a game that played great in the first hour, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, over patches, it got better and stuff like that for sure. So I don't want to knock them, but as a developer, you're I always wonder, making that trade off yeah, of, do we do something for sure. crazy polished? And I'm sure you all, I won't call them out, but I'm sure you all can think of games that that first hour is great. And then there's like nothing there, after mm -hmm. that, you know, or it just feels very <laughs> repetitive or it feels like, just incredibly shallow or something it has nothing yeah. to say whatever um, well, i was also thinking about like uh and this is not true of this game i think it's a great game from start to finish but i was thinking about the stalker games did you ever play those i have not i have one of them though i wish i'd played it but yeah yeah i just it kind of reminds me of the state of decay in the sense that like a super innovative um at the time i think game experience was very immersive very um like unforgiving in a way that was Pretty, that was really compelling um but like a lot of people had a hard time getting into it because it's just just not polished in the way that i think gamers nowadays expect. like i think gamers in a lot of ways have doubled down on that like there's the expectation of this very high level of polish um and i wonder if that sort of attitude is like discouraging you know people to take risks with games like a, like a stalker or a state of decay or whatever that at the time is doing some pretty unique kind of open world, you know, introducing some unique open world mechanics. Yeah. And it's weird too, in the context of developing a game that has a large publisher or something, the publisher will, will typically, the people who are, you know, reviewing builds and stuff will typically only get that first time user type of experience because they're they're not playing it for 10 hours over a weekend they're right. playing it for the build yeah. comes in they play it for one hour and then they're like why are the the feet still sliding on the animations or something right and uh, just, <laughs> right. it's a classically yeah. difficult thing to solve that is ultimately meaningless you know it's like right who cares if their feet slide 
it looks, I mean, it's not meaningless, I guess, but it's not as important as like the game having something to say, whatever, or mm -hmm. having like a, mm -hmm. a story that works out or whatever. Um, yeah. Or even like the user interface working <laughs> the way that yeah. you want it to, like that's even yeah. more important. I think. Or like, or like, yeah, you know, things that stop it from crashing after you've played for eight hours. Like the publisher may not see mm -hmm. that stuff, but they'll always see that level of polish the easiest so like the best publishers will have someone who does play it for 10 hours regularly and then can really give meaningful feedback on that but that's not as common as you might hope um the people yeah. reading the reviews and stuff so that leads to like certain types of games that are more polished but maybe you know what happens in level six is less important right yeah so uh we should talk about that whole experience now that you've released your game um, I'd be curious to hear, like, cause I know you poured a lot of work into this. Like what's the experience been like of now, like releasing it out into the world and letting people react to it? Yeah, it's definitely weird and, and different than in the past for me, because in the past it would always be as a, as a member of a larger team, you would ship the game and then someone else would take over marketing it or, you know, supporting the community or whatever right. it was um and as a really small indie uh you know i kind of have to keep doing all those things there was no like i'm done now time uh and there still doesn't feel like there is because we're working on patches and stuff um and even more so like if you go all the way back to the ps2 era there you had to release your disc to to the manufacturer and that would take weeks at least yeah sometimes more and then you couldn't patch it after that like in the ps2 original xbox era one patch it so you had to like be really sure with your everything flaws was done. well you had to make sure there was no critical <laughs> sure. bug because you couldn't yeah because now if you submit a, a game and there's a and you're say submitting some giant game and you know the console certification team finds some problems you're like we'll fix that in the day one patch or whatever and they're like okay we'll approve it still and then hopefully your day one patch really does fix it and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it doesn't um but it's a lot riskier but you have more opportunity to course correct later uh, whereas back in the day, it was like, no, you're basically done now. Uh, you know, maybe we would do a game of the year edition and that would have a slightly, but particularly for console games, there was no updates. So now yeah. it just rolled immediately from, you know, getting the game approved to working on some day one patch things to working on marketing stuff to um, then going back to patch things. So it's just been, I haven't had the time to breathe and process as much as I had in the past. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one part to it. And it's definitely a game that, you know, some people get really into and, and some people less so. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the interesting feedback has been like, I thought this was going to be an adventure game. It's like, yeah, nope. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and so people would, you know, if someone comes in with expectation based on, you know, some interview they read or something and then they play it and it's a different type of game. Sometimes yeah. they're just like, oh, well, not for me. And sometimes they're like, this game's terrible. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, whereas if you're making Call of Duty or something, no one's surprised by the final product. I mean, they're not, there's delightful things in it, maybe, you know, there's like sure. little tweaks, but sure. the core of what the game is, is a very known quantity. And I would say that's true of like 90% of AAA games that you know what you're getting at from your yeah. really well by the time you spend your money. And I feel like this game has more unexpected surprises for people that may put it in a mm -hmm. genre they don't care for or may, uh, you know. Yeah, so that's yeah. been been interesting to see as well. Can you give Whoa. us an example of, sorry, of like one of those unexpected surprises? I know we, we want to probably be careful not to spoil it too much, but. Yeah, well, I mean, the game has a lot of, it's interesting. We tried to message the way the core narrative works as much as we could in the marketing saying that, you know, the personalities of the preachers are different every time. Um, and we actually say that like in the menus at the beginning of the game and stuff. And yeah. that, Oh, that and is... we should probably like frame this for our listeners a little bit. Yeah. This is a, a church thing. of the darkness is a metal gear, solid, like old school metal gear and solid inspired top down stealth game. We're infiltrating a cult. Right. And then the cult is, is, is Christian socialists from the 70s uh, who are down in South America, and you are trying to find your nephew in there. But then we change it up yeah. because it's designed to be replayed. It has some roguelike elements to it, but then it also has a narrative that is different in that not only can you make choices that lead to a bunch of different endings, but you can also 
just start out with preachers who are different each time. And we actually have menus at the beginning that tell you, by the way, the preachers will be different each time. Um, and you, once you've finished a game, you get new menu options about, do you want to play a set of preachers you haven't seen before? And when I say different, I mean, that's the other thing. We say that, and then sometimes people think, well, that means they're like totally different. Like one time they're Christian socialists, one time they're a UFO cult. But no, they're mm. basically, their dogma <laughs> Their dogma is always the same. It's just a nuance of like how intense and crazy are they going with it. Um, right, yeah. How so, awful, so violent, or whatever. Yeah. Or not so that's violent a pretty tour, uncommon, you know. experimental, weird sort of thing to do with your narrative. And, you know, people are still confused about it. Yeah. You know, I still read reviews where I'm like, well, that's not actually what happens. <laughs> uh, people, you know, and that's that's partly the fault of the game for somehow still not messaging enough. But some people pick up on it and get into it as well. So I almost always, always nice chose, like, I died quite a bit. For my own stupidity, like, I feel like I'm not very good at games is part of the problem. Oh, no, come on. Um, so, I mean, some it just depends, like, but I feel like I wasn't very good at this for some reason. So I would, but I would almost always pick to go back in with the same preachers um, because most of, of my experiences were preachers that were pretty, like, awful. <laughs> I didn't get too many of the, like, sympathetic ones. Um and so I chose to go back to the same ones because I'm like, oh, I'm going to make those guys pay, <laughs> 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 or, or you know, get I got to get, got to get my nephew out of this mess. Uh, so anyway, yeah, and they're I should say too that they're never like they're always extremists and they're always kind of crazy no matter which version you pick they've still moved to right. south america they're still doing weird things it's still like a cult yeah. yes it's never not a cult it's just sometimes the guards will not. still take you down right and they're always they're... hostile to outsiders so there's no version where you walk in and they and that was an off a frequent request of like was there a version where you go in and they just welcome you and blah 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 and i'm like well no because that would be an entirely different i'd be like right. making tunes, right where one is like yeah. metal gear and one is a, a total walking simulator or something yeah, just or the like Sim, uh, the sims or like stardew valley cult edition Right, right, and that would be a cool game. Like I, I or you go and join the cult. <laughs> the other, the other ideas that people have of what this game is are viable, cool games. Right? It's like, yeah, that'd be a cool game. Stardew Valley Cult Edition, great. Let's let's play that. But it would just be not what this game. Is. Right. That's like a massive, um, like that would require a massive amount of design that most gamers don't realize. Right, right. Well, if you turned you just off can't. the, yeah, if they didn't shoot at you and you just walk through the camp unperturbed you know that would not actually be that much fun in the end because you would have no right. challenge um be like but, a five I mean, or ten minute experience yeah. right right um and it's you know i'd love to make a game that varied that much too but it's a very small team so yeah yeah so we were you playing when you were playing did you play on the normal difficulty or did you play one down on the easier difficulty or i i tried it you recommended trying on the e on easy, so I started out there and did pretty well, and then I I I ratcheted it up and died a lot because uh, I was like, oh, I, I'm handling this pretty well, like I can cocky. do. Yeah, yeah, and then I was like, oh, should have just listened to Richard and stayed on easy, but I did. <laughs> when I finally did, I did. I say beat it. I got one of the. How many endings are there? So that's another point of contention with people who've played it is that we have a, a menu in the game that shows 19 different endings you can get yeah and there's actually more variants than that even but uh -huh. i wanted to just help again trying to communicate what this game is to people to say hey there's all these different endings look at everything you can get but i don't actually mean you won't be complete until you've gotten all 19 you know, like it's not it's meant right. to say, look at the possibilities, go get yeah. some of them, <laughs> right. not go get them all. But, you know, so it's <laughs> but it's it's a design of that menu to some types of players are like, well, I got to get all of these, you know, and then, yeah. you know, I'm not saying unless you love I think some people could get all the endings and have a good time. But some would say, I feel like I've seen most of the game, but I haven't gotten these three endings yet. And and. You know, I've been playing for 20 hours or something, and I'm like, mm. well, if you're tired, you're probably you don't need to get those other endings. It's okay. It's okay to not get all the endings. That's what I want to say to folks. Yeah, good luck it's saying that to completionists. To, yeah, the the important thing is uh, is the endings are based on what you do in the game, right? And right. You know, there's there's consequences to your choices, and you can manipulate what happens substantially. Um, 
And so the importance is the fact that you can do that, not that you would then go back and do other things that you don't want to do later or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, podcast producer is a completionist. So he's mm-hmm. going to be listening to this. And well, I deliberately always... the, the achievement, because we have achievements on the consoles and on mm-hmm. Steam, and there's an achievement for getting 10 endings, but that's, it doesn't care after that. So there's no achievement. For getting <laughs> 10 Ooh, I can dig there that. Go. Yeah. There you so go, Jonathan. Ten, if you're I, listening. I almost wish it was like six endings, like because that's pretty good. <laughs> I, I feel like if you get to six, you deserve the achievement. Yeah. Um, so, and it's actually that achievement isn't tied to getting different endings. You could get the same ending a few times, and it would still tick up. Oh, I'm going to speed run that. If you could do it, <laughs> but it's still the gameplay is still different. Like the the layout of things still changes. Yeah. But but yeah, you do. I don't know if uh, you found this, Drew, but. I've a lot of people do get better at the game because you learn the layout of the of Freedom Town and you yeah. learn the systems you can get through a lot quicker on later playthroughs. Yeah, for sure. I definitely got better at it. I think one of my biggest problems was um uh just for some dumb reason I was mixing up uh I don't know how, but I was mixing up the button to um talk to someone versus to subdue them. <laughs> uh <laughs> And so there are a lot of times. Is this like the was, Red Dead Redemption thing where people kept punching their horses or whatever or punching right, people? Yeah, it's kind of the same idea. And so, uh, yeah, there were lots of people that I ne- needed to talk to and wanted to talk to because it would progress the story and Gosh. then all of a sudden they're passed out. I wish I could have um, been there watching you. Yeah, I did, I did that with my nephew. You just imagine uh, your frustration. <laughs> and I didn't realize that like, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this, Richard, but a lot of people like you you subdue them they'll wake up uh you know i don't know 30 seconds later or something like that Mm -hmm. and uh and so you just wait around and then talk to that person again and if they're like a friendly character a character that you can chat with it's they won't hate you for subduing them (laughs) um oh that's cool bro (laughs) yeah they They forget you did it basically they since they lost they lost blood flow they blocked out oh short-term amnesia yeah right well that's what happens when you get knocked out Usually, yeah. right, and you almost always do that from behind, so I was, they didn't even know it was you. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, so I accidentally did that to my nephew, and I didn't realize that so that like triggers this thing where he doesn't wake up, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's Is he's got a he's a weak, he's a weak boy, so when yeah, you knock him out, yeah, he's gonna so, be out for a while. He's still alive, but yeah, he's not so you have to carry out. him, and you can't like sprint when you're carrying him, so you have to carry him all the way to the exit to you know infiltrate him exfiltrate him exfiltrate out. yeah yeah oh, so that was fun but you managed to get him out then in that one i did yeah that was the one, that was the one ending that i got <laughs> just knocked him out and took him yeah yeah wow dude remind me to like, never call you to rescue me from something yeah he's telling me all about this cold and stuff i was like whatever bro let's go <laughs> you'll have you'll get out you'll just have some short-term memory loss and so. yeah a sore neck. Yeah. So what do you, you feel yeah. like is uh what do you feel like's the best bit of like feedback that you've gotten so far? Whether that's like a steam review or you know whatever. Oh, I mean the best ones are where they say it's amazing and they love it. So I I'll Well, I mean like, you know, has there been long. any kind of specific like stories that have come out of that or experiences that people have shared? Hmm. I mean, that's there's definitely been like watching streamers play it has been some of the most fun mm-hmm. because they'll I mean, the thing about the game is that you can get to an ending that has consequences beyond what you expected them to be. Um, so like the only thing you're tasked to do in the game is meet your nephew. You don't even have to get him out. You can just go meet him and leave right away. Um, and then and sometimes that's a good choice to make because in some versions he doesn't want to go and things seem okay and you can decide to leave him there and then see what happens after um based on the endings because basically once you get to an ending you've escaped freedom town and then it tells you what happens over the following years mm-hmm. um but seeing you know streamers who like oh yeah i got alex out and then sure alex was rescued but now something horrible happened to the rest of the cult and they're mm. you, watching them react of like what mm. oh god and then you see how, oh, I see how I could have done something about that. Mm-hmm. And then now I want to go play again. And so that's yeah. the see. I mean, that was very much the desired effect. I'm not saying every streamer has that effect, but a lot of them have that I've watched when they get to an ending. It's like, oh, no. Oh, geez. Yeah. I got to go play again. I, I love that. That was what you found, Drew, when, with the ending you got. 
Yeah, I did because well, this would be a big spoiler if I said what happened. I guess bad but things, bad things happen. Bad, like re- like way worse than I thought. <laughs> like way worse. And I was like, oh man, like I'm kind of a jerk because I just like knocked him out and <laughs> fled. I mean, I feel like I that's I true to life, person. you know. Like that's I love those kinds of choices and consequences in games where it's like it's just not black and white or clear cut because that's that to me is a, a more accurate depiction of like choices that you make in life is the outcomes can be drastically different than what you expected and I love that stuff. Yeah, and that was kind of one of the points of the game. That and that it's hard to know what a, a cult group like this is going to do based on the limited information you have about them. Right. Uh, it was what, what drew me to the game in the first place was that many religious sects or groups that have weird beliefs. And when I say weird, I mean, you know, not mainstream society beliefs. Um, often those groups are fine, you know, and if everybody's not being overly exploited or hurt or whatever being in them, then you should let them go do what they want to do. But sometimes those things end in horrible events. And how do you know from the outside? And and that mm-hmm. was sort of one of the points of trying to figure out, am I dealing with one of the horrible groups or not now? And what would be the right thing to do to fix it if I did decide it was horrible? Um, so that's sort of the hopefully the mystery of the game that keeps people playing for those five or six or ten endings they get. Yeah, definitely. You got to go for ten to get that trophy. <laughs> got to push it just a little bit bit. have you have you had any um like mad christians come after you because of the game no i haven't actually i mean other than drew and i (laughs) i'm waiting for that that's That's why we have you (laughs) that's why we have you here yes yeah no i haven't seen um yeah there have been some people and i won't go into it too much who were didn't like stuff in the game or didn't like the, the existence of the game but they weren't christians i'll just leave it at that Let's leave it at that, shall we? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Intrigue. I, but I don't know. Well, now I'm waiting to see what, what Intrigue. thing it is. He having played it for hours. Like, does the theological underpinnings of the cult hold up? Are you offended, Drew? No, I I thought it was like, um, it actually surprised me in some ways. Because, I mean, it's really kind of like a, a very progressive, in a way, Christian cult. Um, so, like... That was one thing that I just appreciated right off the bat is that you didn't go for any like the really easy low hanging fruit of like ways that games tend to mock Christians, <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. and not like that sort of stuff doesn't offend me. Like the Far Cry it was a Far Cry five that sort of, you know, like gun toting when this yeah, group yeah. is that way a little bit, but like, um, obviously they like guns, but, um, but just like <laughs> the kind of, you know, hyper conservative. Yeah version of christianity that i think is really in some ways understandably mocked by our culture right um but i appreciated that that wasn't the flavor here so it felt immediately felt more welcoming to me um as like as like a christian um but uh do you want to join the cult um maybe i mean are they taking applications (laughs) you didn't get that ending huh (laughs) (laughs) there is no i mean i'm serious there is a there oh, are some it. scenarios where you can go that way. I don't want to give too yeah. much away, but uh, if you do the right things, you might get to stay longer. Right. Um, Have you heard from anybody who's like actually been in a cult that's played the game? Since I know, I'm sure you talked to people prior to some, making yeah, the game, but yeah, for sure. Um, and I've seen, you know, I've yeah, I've seen a few comments from people who are like, "Oh, I was in a cult, and this really feels like it." There was one of the reviews that was my favorite from a smaller site was from a guy who said he was a pastor who also reviews video games. And he thought the it was like he felt the cultishness of it was very much on point. Hmm. Like like you're doing all the things cults do in this game. And he liked that the you know leaders are named Isaac and Rebecca. And that had some biblical he attributed to that a certain biblical meaning, um, which I may or may not have meant. I'll just keep that to myself. (laughs) But yeah, he had really liked it. So that was that was comforting but it was interesting reading his review he's like well clearly these people are misinterpreting scripture and i'm like are they <laughs> you know that's yeah. your opinion right i don't know right. how you like did you think that the, the the quotes they were making over the loudspeaker drew were like overly cherry picked for their position or did you feel like they were cohesive and sound and it's okay so, to say, say that no. again well i guess the question like you you as you were playing 
you know, for, yeah. for listeners, a lot of the narrative comes across the cult leaders talking over the PA system while you play. So you're hearing them right. talk about all range of things from how much they hate the U.S. government to mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, various atrocities committed in the U.S., to you know how the chickens are doing to you know like and they have some <laughs> informational things but then they also particularly isaac quotes scripture that he thinks defends their position and and why they've chosen to leave the u.s and why they think the u.s is sinful uh though he doesn't use that term very often um right yeah but but it you know he is basing it on on the bible um and rebecca yeah. is is the one who is isaac is the more christian of the two is more preachery. And then Rebecca is good with that stuff, but she's more the political socialist of the two. Um, mm. And they sort of have aligned their views and are working together. Um, but, you know, you could see a world where she stops being a Christian maybe uh, after the game, whereas he, he would never do. Yeah. Uh, or flies off the deep end completely. She's on that precipice. I feel like <laughs> in some yeah. ways, like, mm -hmm. like I, which makes sense to me. Like it's a very, uh, I imagine being in a cult could feel that way for a lot of people, um, you know, because obviously like a lot of people leave them and then and it's a very difficult thing to like reenter the real world. Um, but but, yeah, no, I um, I I I thought that like there's even like some hymn singing and stuff and you find some hymns mm -hmm. that were written uh, and like um, th all, all that stuff kind of resonated with me because um you know, I could see people in their zeal, you know, like falling into that kind of behavior. Um, it felt, it felt accurate, I guess, as best I can say as someone who's never been a part of a cult, but like, I have had like religious views that I've changed on, you know, over the years. Um, and, uh, <laughs> like th that's what it made me think back to is like how I used to be really like stuck on certain issues that I'm like not stuck on at all anymore. Um, sort of brought me back to that that place in a weird way does that make sense yeah and yeah i mean they're definitely stuck on their issues <laughs> which are not <laughs> yeah. which are as you say not the traditional christian issues um mm -hmm. they're yeah. more they're more from the uh i was just listening to fresh air the npr show and sister helen prejean was on the uh the famous death penalty opponent who is also a nun catholic nun and mm -hmm. um they're definitely from her school of of the church um not they're not catholics but they're you know from that progressive side and you know sister helen was talking about how she you know doesn't really believe people are doomed to hellfire for eternity and and stuff um mm -hmm. that like what kind of god would do that some hot takes <laughs> yeah and when and also you know as she came out publicly against pope Fra francis saying there need to be female priests in the church and stuff mm -hmm. um even though pope francis is otherwise a very progressive guy not on that issue um Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah and those are definitely that's the sort of christianity i saw in my family was that sister helen version of catholicism mm -hmm. yeah. so they've they've definitely take like than that you know i realized that more and more working on the game that i was like turning rebecca in particular into people in my family um <laughs> <laughs> and i was like oh wait oh what have i done interesting um <laughs> have you heard from any of them like hey did you make no me they're not <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, sadly, my my I have an aunt who was a nun, but she passed late last year um, sometime. She was, you know, quite old and had been not in good health for a while. So it was expected, but sad. She would. But she, you know, um, she would. I don't has don't know that she's ever played a video game <laughs> in, <laughs> while she was around. It's probably not a little worry there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you never, you know, it's another I did have another nun from another wing of the family. Um who thought that any M-rated video game was unacceptable. And I remember mm -hmm. talking to her about, she was like, well, do you make violent video games? And I was like, well, yeah, but you know, they're intended for older players. She's like, yes, but kids will play them anyway. I'm like, I guess. Boom roasted. Yeah, right. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. And she's like, yeah, just unacceptable. <laughs> and I'm like, huh. and then we Ooh. moved on to other topics. You know, she was still Awkward. married. She didn't throw me out or anything out of the dinner we were at. But uh, yeah. So I don't I don't know where. So I've never pushed it with these people of like, look at this game I'm making. It's got some religion in it. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, you never mm -hmm. know how that'll go. I do hope a lot of Christians play the game because, and I think especially with you coming at it from a different angle, 
of like kind of poking at maybe even some of the more progressive things. Like I think it, it will help people. I mean, Drew, you kind of alluded this a little bit, like it will help people see how close they are to becoming fanatical, even if they think themselves not, you know, or how close they are to becoming, you know, fundamentalist a-holes or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. Man, I, I hope a lot of people, I mean, I guess Christian or not, I think it can show us how, you know, one or two decisions or one or two changes could lead to stuff that could be really harmful, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I And I think that um, it definitely will have people thinking about, um, yeah, about like why, you know, I, I think that's the most interesting part of cults to me. It's like, I always want to know, how does somebody land there? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it's really easy for us as a culture. Um, like we're really our culture is really bad at nuance. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we want to I think about like almost the opposite of this, of what you've done, Richard, to me is like Bioshock Infinite. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Like we'll go on. Like, bio- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Bioshock Infinite is this cult, right? You're You're immersed in this cult. That's just like. It's just awful. The worst. And it's, yeah. it's the worst. And also it's it's like kind of the worst Ameri- version, like the worst version of American Christianity you could think of probably. Well, maybe you could think of worse. There's always someone who could think of worse. But... <laughs> it's a bad It's a bad one. <laughs> yeah. But this one, I think, because it changes all the time, you're forced to like think about it more, um, I don't know, more holistically and to see that the nuances and, and the people that end up that end up in these things. Like it's not just a bunch of idiots, right. That mm-hmm. land in cults. It's people like you and me that, um, you know, have concerns and, and a lot of those concerns are really like super valid. Right. Um, they're not all like, they're not all bigots and jerks and, or, or, or imbeciles. Right. Um, right. and I think like in our day and age, uh, where, where our culture is like super bipartisan, we're we're constantly telling each other to make sure that we're have the right view. What whether you're on either side of the aisle, everybody else is shouting at everyone else. Even people that are on the same aisle are shouting at each other to say like, mm-hmm. make sure your views are right on this. Um, and uh, I think this is a game that kind of prom- to me, I felt like it prom- promoted nuance. Uh, and, and more nuanced thinking in a way that I've found to be refreshing. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely the dream uh, of making it was that it's not the version of cults you have seen in some games. Some games have done it okay, but sometimes it's just an excuse to make enemies to shoot, right? To say, well, they're all cult right. members, so you can shoot them yeah, all right. without, yeah. without, like zombies. You can, you know, zombies yeah. are the ultimate video game enemy because they're like humans. And so mm-hmm. you can you can identify that you're fighting humans, sort of, but they're they're without redemption and should be shot in the head because otherwise <laughs> yeah. they'll right. you every time. There's no good zombie, right? Um, uh-huh. So that makes a great video game token to <laughs> incapacitate over and over again, right? Which is yep. what like shootery games are, are about. And whereas I see the cult here is sometimes not that bad, right? Sometimes just doing their thing and you should let them alone mm-hmm. and trying to figure out you know, which one it is makes you realize I can't just assume because they're cult people, I can kill them all. Um, <laughs> and that's sort yeah. of, that's an important point about humans from anywhere. I think, you know, that there's no yeah. point where mm-hmm. this whole group is, is without redemption. Um, yeah. Much as we like to reduce things down to that, it's often not the case. I mean, they may still be doing bad things and something needs to be done, but is mm-hmm. it all of them or is it just the leaders or is it the, you know, how do you get the bad apples out or whatever it is? Right. right. And is there yeah. a, you know, I, an important thing to me in the game is even in the bad scenarios, there's always a nonviolent, not nonviolent, but non-lethal solution to everything. Like it's still yeah. a yeah. You know, infiltration game where you're knocking people out and stuff, but it's not always killing them and knocking them out. And you, that's a choice the player gets to make. Uh, mm-hmm. But even I mean, in the worst scenarios, sometimes you subdue them when you meant to just talk to them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just a user interface failure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The player is always right. That's right. Uh, hey, it worked good. out for you, Drew. You got him out. Yeah, right. I got him out. Yeah, got him out. It was well, not. It's it's sometimes to your advantage too because 
the thing I've seen in a lot of playthroughs is someone's leading someone out. They get in a gunfight and Alex gets killed on the way out of town because he's not invulnerable to bullets or anything, um, which is another yeah. another thing that bugs me a little bit in games is the the civilians can't be shot mechanic. You know, oh, yeah, you can just spray <laughs> you can just spray into the crowd and know you'll only kill the bad guys because guns don't work that up like that. Um, yeah. And, and like, I don't want to reinforce <laughs> that message. Like, if you yeah. want to be a responsible gun owner, that's great. But you should know, you know, like a well-trained law enforcement yeah. person that you can't shoot into the crowd to try to get that <laughs> not, shot. It's just bullets doesn't. are not discerning. Yes, and physics <laughs> physics is not 100% predictable. So, I always think, when people talk about that, I always think of, uh, this is a, this is a wonder, wonderful, it's a wonderful life. Have you guys seen It's a Wonderful mm-hmm. Life? Yeah. Oh, it's one of my favorites. There's movies. that. Yeah, there's that scene where um, the main character like gets into a bar fight, right? And then he yeah. runs, out, and then he runs out of the bar. And uh, the policeman, there's a policeman in the bar that chases him out of the bar, uh-huh. and immediately starts shooting at him. <laughs> 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 and it's like, whoa, wait, like we just start shooting that's at That's in him? the uh, that's in the dark world, if I recall. That's yeah. where he's <laughs> where he's living in the world where he had never existed, and so everything yeah. is right. bad yeah. in town. And it's I think that was, that was one of the things that's like, because the cop in the other version of It's a Wonderful Life, you know, the main the main line timeline, <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, that cop isn't shooting at people on the street, but in the dark world he is. It's interesting to think of yeah. It's a Wonderful Life as like a branching narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's such yeah. a, man, that, I love that movie. Before yeah. it's time. Oh, it's it's great. It's great. And, and, a, and uh, interestingly, critically panned and a financial disaster at the time it came out. I didn't know that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It that bankrupted crazy. the company that made it, which is so the Jeez. full story is it did so badly that it bankrupted the company that made it, which was a small film studio partly owned mm-hmm. by Frank Capra, the director. And that's why they failed to renew the copyright on it. And so it went into the public domain. So then by the seventies and eighties, every TV station would show it at Christmas time because it was free to show. Because mm. nobody owned the rights anymore. And then that made it hugely popular. Because it was being shown all the time. And then that's why it had its renaissance. And then it became so popular that some corporation figured out how to regain the copyright on it. <laughs> now it's no longer public domain. Wow. That's the full, the full cycle. But it, an interesting case of like art not being appreciated in its time, mm. but finding its audience yeah. much later. Well, and I think it's like that, that whole like, you know, branching timeline or uh, alternate reality, like that was definitely before its time. You know, but nowadays yeah. it's like, yeah, I love that, you know, because I'm a movie. nerd. Yeah. I'm like, oh, cool. It's kind of sci fi ish. Right. But there you had the the literal angels talking to each other as twinkling stars. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is every time you rewatch it, it like, you see that opening and you're like, oh, right, this part. Oh. And then it gets. Yeah. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. That part is kind of cringy. <laughs> I do kind of have a soft spot for not soft spot. I just think it's really funny. There's at least. At least once every Christmas, somebody will complain about, like, some Christian that I come across will complain about the theological inaccuracies of oh that film. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, do you smack them in the mouth when they say it? <laughs> I mean, do you yeah. subdue them instead of talking? <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Just, oh, sorry, I pressed uh, pressed E instead of spacebar again. <laughs> yeah. press, press E for Christmas spirit. <laughs> that's right that's well i do like we're kind of running out of time but one of the things we always do on this podcast is kind of get personal with our guests and we talked about at length like your background and your religious background and your you know your wife's religion as well i remember talking about that um like has that has, has making this game because i know like you studied a lot about cults and and probably put a lot like you were in the process of making this game you were probably thinking more about religion than you typically would, I would guess. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so, like, has anything changed for you since making this game? Is your, like, I mean, not even necessarily what you believe, but maybe your perspective about people of, you know, religious people or people of faith? Yeah. Um, it's interesting you say that because that definitely felt that happening where the, you know, even years before I started it, the appeal of a setting like this was let's show some messed up religion stuff. That's fun. Mm. You know? Um, And then as you get into it, I think any, anything you're writing, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the antagonist or the villain, if they're a villain and, and figure out how did they get this way. And in the process of doing that, 
you make them more sympathetic, at least to yourself, right? So you're writing them from yeah. their perspective. So you're like seeing how someone can get like that. And definitely here, you know, seeing how, you know, I'm not a, a weekly churchgoer, um, though I still go with my mom and the opportunity presents itself. But, you know, I, I guess seeing more what people get out of that, I definitely happened over the course mm -hmm. of this project. Like I had some awareness of it and, and my wife's, uh, involvement in the church increased while I was working on this too, which was coincidental because she started working at one and, and that means you're going more and, and yeah. treating it a bit more seriously, I guess. And it wasn't that she was, I mean, the Unitarian, so it's a little more, they don't have a obligation to go every week, for example, right? Yeah, like yeah. Catholics do. Um, so anyway, so I definitely got more thinking about, you know, why people find this so comforting. Um, and I don't want to say comforting in a dismissive way, but, you know, living in a world yeah, without yeah. that is definitely without a, a, a knowing there's a larger context to things can be mm -hmm. can be um, terrifying. Right. So seeing seeing the yeah. like why people do it and that they're not as they're not wrong in doing it, even if, you know, that you mm -hmm. don't, don't have scientific you know basis for all of the Bible or whatever, it doesn't mean that, you know, there's not scientific basis disproving all of it either or disproving depending how you interpret it right like if you interpret it as sure. a literal word of god then you know it's harder to back up than if you see it as parables that are still cosmically true but maybe not mm -hmm. specific detail true um just mm -hmm. kind of like the cat the post vatican II catholic interpretation is that way um so yeah i definitely saw more of the value there it didn't make me you know want to go to church every week but uh, <laughs> sure <laughs> uh but definitely, you know, just trying to get into to what these people valued and and seeing yeah. that even in a group like this, people have different amounts of of their own book, too, that like yeah, some people are, are fully in. And some people are like, I came here for this reason and then this happened. So I'm out. Whereas other people are like, <laughs> I came here for yeah. this reason and then this bad stuff happened. So I'm going to fix it. I'm not leaving, you know, because this is the right way. It's just this one thing. Um Right. So trying to get all of those perspectives into the characters. That's why I'm in it. I'm trying to fix all the things. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Not really. Exactly. Good luck. Exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. So you, you actually said something I think is interesting. It's like, um, you know, you said having a larger context for, for I guess, for life and, and things like that. Or, or not having it could be really terrifying. Um do you have, is there like something that you look to as sort of that larger context for you? Because I mean, I know as someone who's not religious, it's not going to be like, it's not going to be God. What, 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 is there something that drives you to, to keep after it, to keep going? What, and what, and what would that be? I know that's yeah. like a big question, but. That, I, I swing all over the place on that from, from not having anything, which is the dark times to, uh thinking like hmm. well, maybe there is something to this like this couldn't actually be hmm. random or could it you know and like you can yeah. look at things and say so i just i find the human ability to constellate events together into meaningful things sort of fascinating and yeah. like is there actually something there that is like this can't just be random mm -hmm. or or well i don't know got a lot of planets in the galaxy could be um but there's yeah there's, a, yeah, there's the interesting this is sort of tangentially related. I can't remember. I'm not going to do a good job of telling this, but basically there's a name for the, the, the fear that no, maybe we really are alone in the entire galaxy because we have found nothing. Right. Like, there's, mm -hmm. like you, we should have found something by now. Right. Some hint of yeah. something somewhere. And there just hasn't been anything. Um, and not for lack of looking, obviously we're not that technologically advanced to actually fly to other solar systems or whatever, but deep space travel hasn't happened, but, wouldn't why why would they not have come to us or something right so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so it's it's interesting I did also read there's a there's a term that's come up recently called the Anthropocene I think it's called which is the idea that we're in a new geological age because of humans what humans have been doing to the planet mm -hmm. and there was an interesting story in the Atlantic written by a geologist who was like this is the most self centered view. I've ever seen because, you know, in geological scale, the lifetime of like the lifetime yeah, of humans, is right. the, like if you were going to go run a marathon, it's the equivalent of half of the first step or, or less. Yeah, it's right? like so minuscule. Right. And that mm. everything we've done here in geological terms is going to be ground away into dust in 
you know, just another 500,000 years or something mm-hmm. like that, which is just a blip in the life of the Yeah, Earth. just a short yeah. 500,000 <laughs> right. years. So it's like, <laughs> so thinking that the damage we've done to the Earth will, like, it may kill us off, you know, it may mm. make, make the planet inhabitable to us, but the Earth will, you know, keep going so in I some need form, to have right? Somebody look at the foundation of my house, probably, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> It may not be available for your grand, 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 grandchildren, should they exist. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Drew the eleventh. Yeah. <laughs> Where we? Well, that's impossible at this point. But I hope that wasn't too bleak a note to get to the end here. My sort of uncertainty. But. No, I mean, I just, yeah, no, I appreciate your honesty, and I think. Um, yeah, I just these are things I think about all the time, and so I was just curious about you thinking about these things as you're writing a game about extreme belief in a way, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I, I guess I got yeah. sympathetic to people too writing about extreme belief who, you know, I will encounter in life yeah. who have beliefs that I'm like, wait, well, this is this is you're taking this too far. But I'm sort of mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian, so like, if I were president, would I make everyone else a vegetarian? Like morally would i be wrong doing that kind of because everyone gets to make their own choices right but mm. yeah but in making their own choices i think they're you know killing a lot of animals that don't need to be killed so but it's that's that thing and you see vegetarians who are very militant and want to convert everyone yeah and then the other vegetarians are often tired of those people because they just make us <laughs> hate vegetarians you know but are they, are they just more passionate about their beliefs like are they wrong right. yeah they're just better say, than you right they're better if, vegetarians. If someone tries you. to convert you to their religion because they are certain it is the right one, aren't they mm-hmm. kind of doing you a favor? They think they're doing you a favor, right? Yeah. Right. That's what's, uh, I think what I appreciate the most about the Church in the Darkness, your game, is that it hopefully uh, creates compassion in people for a group that's seemingly uh, we shouldn't have compassion for. You know, right. like, I think it's just this known thing that cults suck and people that are in cults suck and they're irredeemable. But I appreciate the nuance in your game that it hopefully gives people some pause and makes them think about a group of people differently, you know, and that interestingly enough, I think that's a real Jesus thing to do because <laughs> like that's what he did. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, talked to people about the Sumerians and you know, these, these people groups that the Jews like just hated to the core and he flipped it on its head. So I love, like, I, I hope more games and media and stuff come out that, that give us those kinds of thoughts. Cause we need it. I mean, just like Drew was saying earlier, the type of climate that we live in, like we really need that compassion. Yeah. And I think games have a unique ability to make you more empathetic. Because they can yeah, put yeah. you in someone else's life. They can put you in an environment you're not used to where you say, hey, wait a minute. This is right. mm-hmm. what I thought it was. And it's, you yeah. know, they say like the best thing to, you know, reduce racism, say, is to, you know, integrate communities. Because as soon as you meet someone from another background or another mm-hmm. you know, yep. skin shade or whatever it is, you're like, oh, you're more like me than you're not. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so yeah. once there's a face. Definitely. Definitely. So, well, hey, great thanks. Talking. Yeah. thanks for making your game. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for coming on to chat about it again. This was great. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'll be so curious, what's I'll be curious what your audience thinks of it if they ever get back to me yeah, on was, that. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely. curious to hear. Yeah. So with that in view, where what's the best way to get a hold of you if people want to tell you their thoughts? Twitter, tweet you their thoughts or Yeah, whatever. Twitter is good. Personal um, cell phone. Yep. We've got uh, <laughs> you know, I uh, It's funny you say that. I was watching a YouTube video yesterday. Um I'm trying to build a bike, which is a whole other story. But <laughs> so I've been watching occasionally videos about how to like put different things together, right? And at the end of this video, this guy gave out like his personal cell phone number. I was like, "Yeah, if you have any questions, <laughs> just text me." Just text me. <laughs> I was like, "Wow, oh. okay, bold, bold move, choice. YouTube dude." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I back in when I did my game design book, I put an email address at the front saying just email me here if you have a question and i did get i didn't it wasn't swamped you know i guess maybe because yeah. it wasn't a controversial book or something like it could have mm-hmm. gotten an email way, address guess, that's but, like i can get that yeah but, but it was it was feels... a special one for the book but you know yeah. i would get mails from people who were students who had a question or who yeah just wanted to say they liked it or or it had a bone to pick about something in it and uh, uh 
it was I, I enjoyed engaging with those folks. So, uh, you know, I like like hearing those stories about this, too. We've got so in terms of getting a hold of me, there's um, Twitter is fine. Uh, Richard Rouse, I, I, I is my Twitter. And then Church Darkness, just Church Darkness, no articles, uh, is the Twitter for the game. Uh, and we can reply to either of those. We also have a Discord server. Um, oh, cool. That is, it's the Fellow Traveler is the name of the publisher of the game. So if you go to Fellow Traveler, I'm just looking at their website right now. I'm pretty sure there's a link to the Discord on fellowtraveler.games. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's traveler spelled with two L's, which is the Australian way to spell it. Um, but if you Google fellow traveler games, that'll pop up. And yeah, I think they have a link to community at the top and that'll take you right into the discord. And we have a church, of the darkness channel in there. And I've gotten some people popping in there with questions about how things work, um, or, you know, what weird endings they got, stuff like that, that I like to hear about. Um, oh, we cool. do have an email as well. Paranoid at paranoid Uh, get emails from folks there sometimes. Uh, often asking for review codes right now, but sometimes <laughs> people who've played it who uh, just want to share like a longer form piece of feedback privately or something. Um, that's great too. And yeah, the cool. website is paranoidproductions.com slash church is the game and has links to the, you know, cause you can get it on PS4, Xbox, switch and PC Mac. So a bunch nice. of places pick which one you want off of paranoidproductions.com slash church. Cool. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, like, is there, what's, like, if someone's like, I want to support Richard, uh, I want him to make more money off this purchase of your game, where where would people buy it? Yeah, so you can get it on, on the stores that come with consoles, of course, and we've also got it up on Steam and on GOG if you want the DRM-free version. It's on Itch as well. Um, we only have the deluxe version on itch, uh, which is probably where we would get the most money, but you can also get the deluxe version on steam. Um, cool. Cause we have, you can get the game, which is 20 bucks and, you know, sometimes goes on sale, but then we've also got for 10 bucks extra, you can get the soundtrack, which has a bunch of songs that the voice actors did some classic mm-hmm. spirituals, some original folk songs that feel like seventies tunes, mm-hmm. um, in addition yeah. to other soundtracks. So it's like 28 tracks. And we've got a bunch of behind the scenes video with that too. So get that deluxe edition. If you're, I think it's, it is called the true believer edition actually. Okay. Get the there we go. right nice. here. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> pick that up. And, uh, that's, you know, if you want to go the distance with the game, I think you'll enjoy the soundtrack and that helps us out yeah. a little more. Yeah. Very cool. Well, great. Well, uh, if you want to follow what love thy nerd is up to, just search for us on any of the social medias. Uh, we also have a Facebook community, which is kind of where most of our, like, following crowd people who are kind of following what we do will are, are there and hanging out and nerding out about nerd stuff so if you want to do that uh just search for love the nerd community on facebook but then you'll also want to like our facebook page on facebook which is just called love thy nerd we have a whole podcast network that you'll want to check out free play is our kind of anything goes type podcast they talk about all things nerd culture um and they also keep you up to date on what's going on with all thy nerd um it's a really fun listen um talk about a lot of board games a lot of video game content too so go check that out uh the pull list is our comic book podcast so if you want to dig deep into the world of comics and what they mean and why they're valuable um definitely check out the pull list uh i think that's about it oh we have facebook live shows are well they're shifting actually now but we have uh beard bros and co-optional so if you are into board game reviews, definitely uh, check out Beard Bros. And then Co-Optional is an opportunity to to win a free game and watch Matt and his wife play uh, one of the games that that he played on Beard Bros. So uh, a lot of stuff to check out. Go check out lovethynerd.com to check out what we're doing. We have a conference coming up, our very own Love Thy Nerd Con, LTN Con. It's going to be in Dallas. Uh, in October, October 4th through the 6th. Did I get that right off the top of my head? Yeah. Chris? Okay. Yeah, October 4th through 6th. It's in Dallas. Um, It's only like early... By the time this comes out, early birds deal will be over, but it's only 100 bucks. So, um, yeah. Consider coming and hanging out with us. If you want to hang out with us in person, you can do it in Dallas in October. Uh, Chris and I will both be there. So uh, we would love to meet you. Uh, if you have questions about this podcast, you can email me. I'll give you my real email address, Drew at lovelander.com. <laughs> because you can figure that out anyway. Oh, probably. here, let me look up your number. I'll give that to him, too. <laughs> yeah. My social security number is... Yeah. No. Uh, 
Well, Richard, thanks again for coming on. This was awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, I loved it. I loved being on the last time and uh, getting to talk to you guys about it. It has been really fun. It's a 